This is one of the great mysteries, by the way. Um, it's 2010 that in a speech in Potsdam, Angela Merkel gives this famous speech in which she uses the phrase that multiculturalism has failed. Multiculti, as they call it in Germany, it has a very, slight, very, very slightly different connotation. Um, but uh, uh, she said it's failed utterly. And just to remind you of one other thing she says in that speech, she says, I think it's the first time a German chancellor said this, she said that one of the first mistakes that Germany and other European states made in the post-war period when the Gastarbeit or the guest worker programs began, which was when <clears throat> the immigration really began in Europe, um, was that, as Merkel said, we thought that the workers would return home. This is, by the way, this is a very remarkable admission and a remarkable thing to admit you got wrong. I mean, <clears throat> like all of this, it's all obvious in retrospect. I mean, if you import a very large number of people to form a workforce after the war, it's very likely if they're male, they might want to meet females or <clears throat> that they might have wives. And that if there's a man and his wife, they might even make children. And that if they have children, those children may well need to go to school. And so on and so forth. All this is absolutely predictable. And, and also, what's more, that after enjoying a standard of living that is better than in the country they've, gone, they've come from, they might want to stay in the country which gives them a better standard of living. Completely predictable, except not expected by any of the European states when they invited the guest workers in. So then, something, and by the way, just to finish on the Merkel bashing for a moment, um, the, the interesting thing about that 2010 speech, which was, yes, it was then repeated by David Cameron, who was then Prime Minister, and also by then former Prime Minister, uh, President of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, um, was that if, if it had been going so badly by 2010, why would you ramp up the immigration to a historic high five years later? Or to put it another way, what had you done in the five years in between to make sure that this time it was going to work really well? And the answer is nothing. There was just nothing that the German government had done that improved anything over those five years. And, but then to go back just once more on the run up to how they got there, it's... The fascinating thing is, so the first thing was we thought the workers would go home, and they didn't. That's the first phase of post-war European immigration. The second phase is the realization that if you have these people, you will quite rightly need to, for instance, put in all sorts of uh, anti-racism legislation, anti-discrimination discri uh, legislation, and so on. So there's a period at which you, you get legislation to accept the new reality that exists. Um, then you get to the very strange position that Britain and, and most other Western European countries were in by the 1980s, which is to say, you basically have the right, since you're going to stay, to pursue whatever the life you want to pursue is. So if you, um, if you came from uh, uh, Pakistan and you've moved to a hill town in the north of England, you basically have a Pakistani culture and just get on with it. And, and by the way, that period now, we're sort of doing a a retrospective crime scene thing on a lot of that now. The things that we now realize we're allowed to go on during that time, I mean, again, only the sharpest edge bits, but they are ones that are increasingly embarrassing to us. I mean, I remember during that period, you know, the thing of, for instance, a British girl at school, if she was of Pakistani origin, disappearing from school to be married off to a relative in Pakistan, and the school just accepting that that's what happened. I mean, now that wouldn't be possible. We'd, we'd... But at that point, that was sort of normal. Because, because I say, we basically had this idea, you will pursue your national or cultural life, and you happen to be in our country. And then something else happened. The, that was the multiculturalism thing, where, whereby your society is the convener, and you all practice what you want. And then the final stage, which is the one that we have been at until recently, and who knows what the next one will be, was... Totally different. The final stage was, actually, we don't want you to do that. We want you to become like us. I mean, I mean these are all wildly different things to demand of a group of people. For, I mean, not least the gap between be who you are and what you want to be and become me. And so my problem with the multicultural era was that it, yes, that it, that it had this view of the state is basically like the United Nations. You know, we convene people uh, to be here, but we take no particular view on 
on what you do, as long as you don't break the law. And even then, on certain aspects, the law is malleable, depending on cultural concerns. So that was, that was my main cr criticism of it. And, and just, sorry, a final, final point on that. You're right. I mean, the, 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 the French... I, I sometimes think that the, the, the country that comes out of this best in the end will be France. Because France, like... And I'm not saying this just because I'm here in the US, but, but France, like America, has an idea that you can assimilate into and which I think people can feel positive about. One of the great challenges that a country like Britain, for instance, is going through is that, you know, I mean, we, we don't even have a constitution, you know. I mean, um, it, it, it's, it, it, it works differently. And it's not clear what we want to do. So, so what we have done is to say we will redefine ourselves and my definition of it is that we've redefined ourselves to be as broad as possible in order to accept as many and as wide a range of people as possible. Because you have to, because if you've got the whole world coming to live with you, you're going to have to give a very, very wide self-definition. But that the, res the resultant problem is that you have a very shallow self-definition. So in Britain, we say you must share British values like a kindness. Show me the country that actually says we're for meanness, you know. Um, so we have these very shallow, we're for queuing, you know. <laughs> By the way, sorry, this is another reason for the, what I describe, the, the modern European moroseness, is that there was a period after the, the, what you had very bad race riots in the UK in the summer of 2001 um, in the north of England, and... Uh, it immediately it, 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 it helped accelerate the whole discussion about multiculturalism and so on, and various people came out and started critiquing it. But the striking thing then, and the 2005 Bonlieu riots in France, and a whole set of things that have happened since, led to a very odd argument. What, what it began with in 2001 was, multiculturalism is going badly wrong in Britain, but where is it going right? And I remember this period because I wrote some of these articles myself. Uh, you would say, um, the French model seems to be the one that's going well. And then everyone burns down the suburbs and you don't use the French example anymore. And normally, like with every claim, you end up with Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> All of you know what I mean. It's always, it doesn't matter, it's economics, anything. It's always like, ah, the Norwegian model. <laughs> And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'm more of a Danish man myself. Uh, yeah. um, but no, the, the, uh, we ended up with the Scandinavian models, except then Scandinavia had a whole set of problems from this. So now the problem with it is that no one has any models. We just, no one says that anymore. No one even does a kind of, well, there's a, you know, Germany, uh, Germany, no, no one. This, is, again, is a very bad sign for the future. You have to forgive me. I, I can only fall back on anecdote on some of this because there is no stat. But I know a very large number of people in the UK who themselves, for instance, came to Western Europe in order to flee oppressive regimes and who knew whereof they spoke when they talked of oppression whose children or grandchildren have more hardline views than them. So, for instance, I know I can think of a large number of people who themselves would never wear the veil, left a country because they didn't want to have to be told what to wear, for instance, whose children and grandchildren do. Now, I'm not against the wearing of the veil, but for any woman of that background who knows what it means to take it off, they also know what it means to put it back on. And I, I'm, it's, it's one of the things I say in the book, this is one of the ones that's open. It, we, we, we have proceeded along the presumption that our societies are so attractive and our rights so desirable that anyone who moves in will surely see the point of them and want to join the party. And I say it's, it's, it's possible that that goes in a different direction. And not the least of the reasons why I worry about that is that there is, the, there is the problem of what I say, the, the society that says we are the convener but basically make no other judgments. You know, we don't... Somebody said to me recently when I was speaking at a school in the UK, 
basically, we've been given a bit of advice on sex education and personal hygiene. But beyond that, we're not told very much about what the hell we're doing here. Do you know what I mean? It's, the state is very, very wary, and understandably so, about making pronouncements about you know, personal happiness, meaning in life, existential questions, and so on. It, it, we leave it. We say that's, that's for people to find in their own time. But what if, what if other people have a very, very strong and determined view of, of what to do? And let me give you a very quick anecdote on that. I was speaking recently to a film producer in the UK who came over to me at something and said, a very, very smart woman, done some terrific films. And she, she said, Douglas, you seem like the person. You, you, you can answer a question to me. Again, again, the extremist point. But she, says, she says, what do ISIS want? And I said, oh, well, that's quite easy. I mean, they, they want to invite the world to Islam, uh, um, uh, bring about an apocalypse in the end times, and, uh, and that, you know. And she said, well, no, obviously, that's ridiculous. I mean, what do they want? And I said, okay, we'll do it again. Uh, they, they want to invite the world to Islam, bring about a great conflict, and then an apocalypse, and the end times. And she said, mm, no, I, I mean, obviously, that's not going to happen. But, and I realized that we were talking two totally different languages. Or at least she didn't want to understand a language which a significant chunk of the world, Muslim, non-Muslim, has, which is very, very significant existential answers to things. The meaning of life, love, birth, death, the afterlife, everything. And we, we to an extent, are in this position where if a group like ISIS, for instance, said, what we'd really think is that you should raise uh, interest rates by 0.25%, we go, ah, well, that we had understand. That seems like a reason, and then we can debate whether or not they should. But this, these sorts of questions to societies like ours in Western Europe, and I think some of this resonates here too, is that we, is that we, we don't even understand what people are talking about in that realm. And so I think that there is a significant bit of this whole growing tension comes from people who believe they have the source of all meaning and the answer to everything, walking into a society that is effectively a vacuum of values and other things. I think that the main problem today is not with the effects of immigration per se, but rather it's a problem of Western civilization itself. Um, Western civilization, in a way, has lost its identity. We have confused tolerance with relativism. Mm. And... Uh, Everything is more or less the same. Uh, the maximum value seems to be my well-being and my pleasure. Hmm. The, the problem is the mass movement of people into a place that is uncertain what it is. You could argue that one causes the other, or the, the second means that the first occurs because you don't know why it wouldn't. But it's obviously that combination of two things that is the cause of our present discontents. Of course, Gramsci succeeded. Gramsci yeah, of course. Uh, of course, I know. I'm saying, of course, he succeeded. And how? Well, Gramsci's children everywhere these days. It's not a contradictory position to, for instance, say, we're not doing very well with it at the moment, or we're doing well at bits, but we recognize that slowing it down would make it easier to integrate the people we already have. I mean, it, 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 we, we all know examples in our lives of this. If, if you're from a particular school, for instance, or whatever you call before you go to school, as you call it here. Well, what do you call this? University, yeah. But you also call this school, don't you? Anyhow, well, what, you, what we would call school before you go to college. We all know that if you go with a group of people you know well already, you're quite likely to stick with those people quite a lot of the time. Okay? Or the people from your hometown or people who, who are at your school. So a group of, if you go to a place with a group of friends, it's possible that you'll jinx each other for making many new friendships because you'll spend a lot of time with each other. Um, it's, it's, it's not you know, mad to think that the larger the number of people who come in knowing other people like them, the less need they have to go out into the rest of the society and to be a part of it. I mean, I think a lot of evidence shows that 
the larger the number of people you bring in at the same time from the same place, the less likely it is that they're going to go out and involve themselves in the rest of the country and the rest of society because they don't have to. They can just pursue the life they recognize with the people they recognize um, in a different place. So I think it's, it's at the very least, one should see it's, it's being reasonable to take the view that it's not going to solve all the problems. It doesn't stop all the terrorism. But that if you have a challenge, let's say, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, for instance, ramp up the migration within which the challenge exists. And um, I mean, I mean it, it seems obvious to me, and I think it seems obvious to most of the public, but of course, I mean, you have all these other challenges ahead of you still. But I mean, we are very, 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 very bad in this country, as, as in mine, of really knowing even which questions to ask and what, you know, the most basic, basic things we don't do anymore in terms of background check, in terms of, you know, we always have these dreams that there are people in our society who really know what they're doing. I'm afraid the more you learn, the less you believe that. <laughs>